So Nancy Hopkins was one of the first junior faculty, if not the first junior faculty of the can the second junior faculty of the Cancer Center. And, and there are many wonderful things. I'm just going to summarize a couple of them about Nancy, but she just told me five minutes ago that she was the one that suggested Phil Sharp to the search committee. That, I think, was a very wonderful thing to do as well. Nancy um, has been a Cantabrigian for almost all of her scientific career. She was um, uh, with Mark Potashny um, at, at, at Harvard, and she did seminal work working on viruses there. These, time, these were the lambda phages, the viruses of the bacteria, looking at the operator, and, 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 and making important discoveries. Then she went to Cold Spring Harbor, where she worked with Jim Watson for a brief period of time, where she then worked on DNA tumor viruses. And then she came back to the faculty of the Cancer Center where she started working on retroviruses. So we heard about BOLD from several of the leaders um, this morning who told us about that Salvador Luria didn't want use just any old thing done well, but really difficult things done well. And it strikes me that Nancy at every juncture had to change and do something different and do it, and do it well. Um, in the first period of her career where, where I was most, I would say, familiar with her work in the sense that I knew what she was publishing, it was very embarrassing for me because her papers were um, too smart for me. I didn't understand them. She was doing all of this RNA sequencing stuff with RNAs. This was difficult and sophisticated stuff. Um, and she did really great work um, in, in uncovering many of the functions and, uh, of, of RNA viruses and their tropism. And, and if that wasn't enough for Nancy, so that in roughly 1990, she decided to switch and work on zebrafish. And, and, and you know, this was at a time when zebrafish was only the hint of a promise, really. And, and really, through Nancy's breakthroughs, people can do mutagenesis in zebrafish, and they can discover genes, and they can understand genes, and, and, and this is what Nancy has been doing for the remainder of her career. Of course, she's also uh, a member of the National Academy of the Institute of Medicine of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and um, she also has done tremendous work for women and minorities in science, for which she has, I hope, received due recognition and will continue to, because this, this is really important work. Um, Nancy has is, is done all of these things. She's the Amgen professor um, of now the Koch Institute. And Nancy, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce you. Gosh, well, you just gave my talk, so I need a new talk. If anybody has a talk, I'm, to, I'm available. Um, OK, 10 minutes, let's see. Got time going. Shouldn't have had the third glass of wine. Okay. Um, I, um, when I read the schedule for the symposium, I was extremely startled to see that I had apparently agreed to give comments at this dinner. <laughs> I was certainly honored, but totally alarmed, upon learning that David Baltimore and Bob Langer were also speaking. They are the most influential scientist and the most influential bioengineer of our generation, and I sort of wondered what the heck was I supposed to talk about. <laughs> okay. So I consulted with Angelica, and she said, I was chosen to speak for historical purposes. <laughs> I discovered molecular biology in 1963, <laughs> the same year the genetic code was cracked. <laughs> you wanted history, you got history. <laughs> As a Harvard undergraduate, I heard Jim Watson lecture, and I said, whoa, not only are those molecular biologists discovering the secret of life, one day they're going to cure cancer. What was not completely clear to me was the time scale. I thought it might take 200 years. In 1963, we didn't know enough about, uh, to, even to be able to work on the molecular biology of cancer, but incredibly, five years later, we could. Uh, and as um, you already know my entire career, you know that I worked with Mark Potassny on lambda virus and isolating repressor and showing how it could bind to DNA. So I figured as a kid, you know, I was a kid, I was, a, I don't know, 18 something, 20, 19. Um, if you could understand how a phage worked, a virus that infected bacteria, what the heck, why couldn't you understand how a virus caused cancer? Seemed pretty obvious to me. And you just, if you could figure that out, we kind of thought the whole problem might unravel and just fall on your lap. I did not apply for a faculty job because women weren't allowed on university faculties in those days. 
However, all of a sudden, uh, due to civil rights and affirmative action, suddenly universities had to hire us. <laughs> and uh, suddenly I got a call from MIT and from Harvard Medical School asking me if I would take a job. Please, take a job. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Jim, <laughs> Jim Watson told me to take the job at MIT because David Baltimore understood how to grow animal cells and culture and how to grow viruses, and no one at Harvard did. They were clueless. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it, it all came down to water quality, and so I came to MIT for the water. <laughs> now, many of my colleagues in the phage world said, you're crazy, cancer research is the graveyard of scientific careers, but who the hell, who cares about that? It was too exciting to pass up. Besides, I figured if I was going to be in a graveyard, at least I could be interred with David Baltimore, Phil Sharp, Bob Weinberg, and many of you. <laughs> And as you know, if you want to do something exciting in science, you have to jump off a cliff. Fortunately, we're smart. We threw ourselves off the correct cliff, and here we are. So today we know that uh, worldwide, 25% of cancers are caused by viruses, and 75% are caused by mutations in cells. But that wasn't the point at all of what we came here to do. The point was to get your handle on the genes, any gene that could transform a cell into a cancer cell. And this was before molecular cloning was possible, so viruses were the only way that I could imagine you could do it. Incredibly, it did not take long. And we moved there, I thought it was 1973, Phil said 74 today, whatever. It was just three or four years later, so 77, uh, that the answer actually came. If you are of a certain generation, then you probably remember where you were when you heard that John Kennedy had been shot. I recall where I was when I learned the function of an oncogene for the first time. My office was on the fifth floor, opposite Phil's office, on the other side of Margarita's office. So I'm sitting there at my desk. There was no email, so he rose on the phone. The phone rings, and it was Jim Watson, and he was calling from Colorado. Now, those of you who know Jim know that he is famous for keeping secrets and that his lifetime record is three seconds. <laughs> And Jim said, Ray Erickson has just discovered that SARC is a kinase. A kinase, I thought. Ooh, a kinase? Oh, what the hell does that mean? So I go out of my office, I race out. Phil is just stepping out of his office. I said, SARC is a kinase. And he said, a kinase? Ooh. So <laughs> at that exact moment, we look down the hall from Margarita's office. We're standing there, and we see David coming down the hall from the men's room. And we say, David, SARC is a kinase. And David says, oh, a kinase? <laughs> we were not euphoric, and I think the explanation for cancer did not instantly drop into our laps the minute we heard it was a kinase. In fact, scratching our heads, standing there, the three of us with uh, Margarita, we sort of thought, uh-oh, we're in for the long haul here. We could, might even have to talk to biochemists. And then David, looking somewhat disgruntled, turned to walk away. I can remember it so clearly, as if it was yesterday. And he looked over his shoulder and he said, cancer is never going to be cured. It's too damn complicated. <laughs> remember that? Do you remember that? No. How could you forget? Because that's the trouble. You might have said, that's the trouble. When you're famous, you know, people remember everything you say, and they bring it back and throw it in your face years later, and you wish they'd forgotten it. 